Hey guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I interview Dr. Ben House once again. We are talking about his recent journey to getting leaner than he's ever gotten before. We talk about his coaching experience with Dr. Eric Helms, uh, why he wanted a coach on his side. We also dig into why he's actually not wanting to take it to the bodybuilding stage. Uh, might give you some thoughts to why or why not you might want to take it to stage. And we also dig into some of kind of the diet fatigue he's been experiencing, what he's done with his training, and what he plans to do after the diet is over. Always a great chat with Ben. And if you guys are listening to this podcast regularly, please make sure you're subscribed. And if you really enjoy it, please share it with anyone else you think might enjoy it. And of course, like it if you're on YouTube. And if you're over on Spotify, please give us a friendly rating. Five out of five would be amazing. We appreciate all of the love. And of course, share it over your social media platforms as well. Let us know that you're tuning in and give us a tag. But without further ado, let's get into the show. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Dr. Ben House back on the show. It's actually been about 10 months since you were last on, Ben. I don't know if it feels like longer to you or what sort of time it feels, but it's been 10 months and we we're talking about processed food in that last one to jog a memory. Yeah, that was that was a, that was a fun conversation. I think we were still at the tail end of yeah, that would have been like last December-ish. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was it's always a pleasure, always an honor. I appreciate that. And uh, we've kind of flip-flopped. I, I'd been kind of, I watch Ben on social media, like sounding like a real creep here, but I, I keep an eye on Ben and how he's doing and uh, he's getting shredded. That's what I noticed. And uh, I jokingly reached out to him and asked kind of, when's the show? And I'm still kind of like, not sure if there is one and we're going to discover something today, uh, but he's been getting pretty lean. And I always find it, I, I love, that's part of the people I love bringing on the show are very smart individuals who kind of know the evidence-based kind of spiel, but also practitioners too. So they put it into action. So I love when I kind of get to talk to people who know like how things should work in practice maybe, but then, or rather like on paper and then in practice, maybe it doesn't quite follow that way. But uh, Ben, without me blabbing too much, what made you commit to kind of going down the route of trying to get pretty shreddy? Cause I don't know if you estimate your body fat, but I mean, sub 10 for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, so I mean, I've done ultrasound, like I've been ultrasounding myself, the scientist in me. So like there's, there's like two to three millimeters of subcutaneous adipose tissue on multiple sites. I don't think I'm going to get glute lean. I don't know. I've, Eric, Eric Helms is my coach. He's been, he's been kind of running me through uh, the quote unquote prep process. So I actually committed to this man before I had a daughter. So I committed to do this. Oh, wow. Yeah. I committed to this like three and a half years ago. And like, one of my core values is, is integrity. And so like, I try to do what I say, uh, even if, even if the world goes to complete shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and one of my, so one of my co-coaches or uh, just a, just a really good friend. Um, he won his pro card when he was 19, lost his pro card. Cause he just didn't care and wanted to run a gain phase. Uh, he's, he's natty lifetime natty, uh, Ryan liqueur. And so just competed, this, right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. He won, yeah. he won his pro card back. When his yeah. pro card back, um, he's 30, 33 now. Um, and so I think he's going in November. I think he's going to do some, he's doing, he's got one more show. Um, so the idea was always like, I was going to kind of just do the, just do this with him. I had no goal of going on stage or anything like that. But I, I've, I said back in like 20, man, 2018 or 2019, somewhere in there that I would do it. Like, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll cut with you. I'll, I'll, I'll do the things. And, um, it's been a really fun experience. And I think you, like you hit it, you said it well, and like you have these ideas of what should happen. Right. And then you actually have the experience yourself. And that's one thing that I, that I, I, I've been, I've power lifted, I've Olympic lifted, um, I've toyed with bodybuilding for, you know, since I, I think we've all toyed with bodybuilding, um, in, in a certain aspect. And then some people are like, oh, that's stupid. I don't ever want to do it. And, and that, I think, I feel like that's almost like a guardian against like a, it's a scapegoat against actually going out there and putting yourself out there. Sure. Um, and cause it is, it's man, I don't know that there could be, there's, there's a lot of things that you know, can have people shaking in their boots, but to go on stage and just be judged by a bunch of other people and even coaching, like to stand in front of somebody else and, and, and like, here's what, here's, here's what looks good on your physique. Here's what I think we can improve. Like, 
uh, there's a level of vulnerability there that that is daunting. Yeah, for sure. I, at this, I, I didn't intend to ask this question, but I think it's one worth asking because I think people will be interested. Why aren't you going to take it to stage? Because if you're getting to the point of which, I mean, arguably you're in conditioned where you could be competitive, why wouldn't you take it that next step? I, obviously, there's there's lots yeah. of barriers there potentially, but I'd love to hear from you kind of, I'm assuming it's not logistics or money or whatever. I'd be interested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have a daughter and uh, my wife and I have talked quite a lot about food and bodies and what we want to portray for her. Uh, so I did, so I hover in the mid 180s, um, low 180s normally. I've been as high as 195 on my on my quest for, for weight on the bar. Um, and I'm currently buzzing at like 165. Um, okay. So I've lost a significant amount of weight. And I went from the mid 180s to one, the low 170s without doing any like without measuring anything not even taking my weight um like i took my weight like once a week um and i and when we had a daughter because i i have a phd in nutrition i mean i've measured food for years like like in my life i have measured food for a consistent year like in college um and so when when i had a daughter i was like all right i'm gonna put all that away and so i didn't even i didn't even weigh myself I would make myself like once every three months or something like that. The only thing I cared about was like process outcomes. So like, am I showing up to the gym? How are my lifts doing? Things like that. Uh, didn't weigh any food, kind of just stayed weight stable. You could, I, I would argue that I probably had some regional hypertrophy, um, brought up some lagging muscle groups, but probably wasn't really in a consistent excess of calories. I don't think maybe hovered a little bit. Who knows? I have no idea. Um, but that wasn't my main goal of that point in my life it was really to kind of let go of these of these metrics and let go of this counting um and so i was able to lose and and i think this is i always have to preface this with i'm a male who moves a lot who has a significant amount of muscle mass so for me to lose go from you know mid 180s to one seven low 170s to lose objectively probably 12 pounds of fat the only thing i had to do was stop eating processed foods and like I limited my portion of carbohydrates at those two meals. Like that's all. And I just literally upped my restraint intake. And so this will piss a lot of people off who struggle with weight loss. Um, and, and I, so I say this with a level of empathy that I probably am burning a lot more calories than normal people because I have more fat free mass. Um, and so I was able to do the beginning of the cut and I've done that multiple times in my life before. Like I've cut to 172, 173, with different levels of tools multiple times, but I've never really gone down under that. Um, and I think there's a reason because I, the more people I talk to, there seems to be this point where things get hard. And I don't, I don't know if you've had this experience um, in your podcast with, with Berto. He kind of, he, he said how he's, he's been able to get to real shredded, like stage level lean, uh, not counting anything, using kind of, I, I wouldn't call it an intuitive approach because it's more like an experiential approach. Um, and that word, the, it's good to be a little bit careful with that word as, and how we use it and, and show, but I find it interesting. Like if I did this again, I think I could get to this point that I'm at right now, which is most of my body is, I would, you can give me a better estimate than I can, but like most of my body is shredded enough. My hamstrings and my glutes aren't out yet. Would you, would you agree? Yeah. And you put you under good lighting with a tan on, you're not looking half bad at all. Yeah. Yeah. If I don't, if I do the, if I do the classic physique division, uh, in natural bodybuilding, which I can, which I guess is, is everyone right. Um, I, I might, I might be competitive. Um, and so th that's, that's been really, really interesting. And so I got to this point in the low one seventies where like my processes weren't working. Like the dial wasn't moving. I wasn't getting objectively leaner. I was kind of just wasting time probably in a lower energy availability state. And, and I always had, I talked to Eric about this earlier. And, and so I reached out to him. I was like, Hey, do you want to, you want to work together? I'm going to try to pace car with my, with my, with my friend basically and, and, and get, get shreddies. Um, and he's like, yeah, let's, let's, let's have a talk. Let's, let's do this. Um, and it's been, 
it's been a really cool experience to have some of my sacred cows busted. Like I don't feel as bad as I would have thought I would. Um, like I don't actually feel that terrible. Like my hands are cold. I could wear a sweatshirt in a hundred degree weather. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, and I have, like I was in Austin last week and I was, I was walking around, it was 101 and I was, I was walking around in a hoodie uh, and I was not uncomfortable at all. Uh, and, and so it's been, it's been, it's been good for me to have this experience and I can, I can talk about why I feel like it's been good. And maybe that's me uh, post hoc rationalizing what could be described as disordered eating and body dysmorphia. Um, but I, I, I feel like there are seasons in one's life and I don't think me personally, I like a little bit of winter. I like a little bit deprivation. I think that if you look at health, if you look at just overall mental, like psychological, like vanilla sky quotes, like you can't, the sweet isn't the sweet without the sour type thing. Um, and, and that's kind of a, that's been an ebb and flow in my life throughout. Um, but I, I really, there's something to be said for that deprivation and at least like the appetite reset is, is potentially huge, right? Um, if you've been struggling to gain, it seems like a silly thing to do is cut, but if you've been struggling to gain, maybe, maybe it is time to do, to reset your appetite and, yeah. and do a little cut. Yeah, I definitely use, um, well, my last mini cut that I did was literally for that reason and it mm -hmm. com completely worked. It did exactly what I needed it to. So, uh, I can definitely speak to that. But um, I don't know if I, I, I want to clarify what your reason for not stepping on stage was. I know you oh, talked yeah. through kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah. How, where you got to and then introducing Eric. And I definitely agree. There's like that lower end. I don't know if you can call it like a lower end settling range or like that dual intervention model, that kind of point of which you're like, the body's like, nah, mate, you're, you're starving. If you're going to go below this, you're going to have to do some wacky stuff to get us to lose body fat. Um, but yeah, what's, uh, I guess... Was your daughter related to that reason as well for like stepping on stage? Yeah, I have I have a three year old. Um, I I don't know that she needs to see me do a male beauty pageant. Um, <laughs> not to say that there's no I'm not throwing any shade. There's there's no shade to be thrown here. Um, my my wife and I have done a lot of internal work with our bodies. I feel like both of us. Um, to be able to accept who we are, no matter, you know, where we are in, in our, in our journey. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I just, she's not crazy with the idea of me going on stage and I'm not attached to it. So, and she's the most important person in my life for, I mean, both of them are. Um, and so I'm not going to go do it behind their back. Uh, and, and, nor could I, right? Like you said it, like, like someone's going to post it, like <laughs> that would, that would be super shady on my part. Um, and, and I think I could, if I really wanted to do it, that would, that would be different, but I don't necessarily at this point in my life, like I don't, that's not why I did it to begin with. Like I did it. I, yeah. I wanted to experience bodybuilding. I wanted to have a coach. I wanted to learn the poses to kind of feel how difficult it was. Um, to have that experiential knowledge of like, oh, this is this is this thing, um, and I understand so much of like, I, I I understand why people love it, I understand why they don't want to come out of shred shredland. I I I into it like in my head, I always I could think about these things, but I didn't have that type of experience. And now and now I do. Like, I, if you would have said to me a year ago, like nothing tastes as good as lean feels out of like that's super messed up man that is super dumb and but now i get it like i get it i get it in my bones like oh yeah yeah i, I understand uh no i appreciate that i think that makes a lot of sense i think it's just nice for people who might be in a similar position to you where they just have this kind of like want to get to that sort of level of condition and experience mm -hmm. it maybe they want to take people to stage but they're like i kind of feel like i i need to have experienced that somehow to get them uh, to be as good as a coach as I can be to kind of walk that walk but I have no desire to actually step on the competitive stage which I completely get like it's a kind of weird thing to do to be honest and I hope most bodybuilders actually take that approach like it's something I will regularly say like I bodybuild as a consequence of the fact that I love like the process and the training and the, like, the off season and like yeah. this is just like part of the course it's not the fact that I'm doing everything for that, that stage so uh, I, I think that's a better reason than like just literally oh, i wanted to step on stage and there was nothing else i wanted to win the trophy type of thing i, I really appreciate that 
Yeah, I think if you're doing it because you don't feel like you're good enough or you're doing it for some kind of outcome, I think you're going to eventually you're going to get yourself into more trouble because yeah. um, you're going to have attachment. You're not going to want to see fat come back on your body. Uh, and and that's that's been something that so I am obviously the scientist in me like my wife also, I've done a lot of like self experimentation, um, like very high training volumes. Like, so she, she inevitably like, Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing now? Uh, so, and I, I, I can, you know, I can definitely understand that. And, and so this is, this has been fun in that I'm going to, I'm got, you can tell I'm a little sniffly, which, I, which again, I think is part for the course of people getting lean, right? You get these upper, I'm just trying to not let this go into my upper respiratory tract. Uh, so I'm on a, Eric's got me on a, you know, a diet break just to kind of potentially get, not get any, um, it's probably just a cold, but let's not take any chances. And, and so I'm going to get labs. So I'm going to, and this is something that I, I bet you're talking about with Trex is this idea of metabolic adaptation. And I'm really curious and, and Helms has talked about it and I've talked about it too, like this idea of red reds. So relative energy deficiency in sport, low energy availability. And so the signal of being in an active deficit versus the signal of being at a very low body fat percentage. And and I'm curious, so I'm going to, I'm going to eat at um, probably an energy availability of 40 to 45 kcals per kilogram of fat free mass. So that's how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to exit this prep is I'm just going to eat at that and then get lab work and see kind of when my systems come back online. Like, and I, I would hypothesize that right now that I will be able to stay leaner then I think, and those systems will come back online. That's kind of my hypothesis. Whereas if before this experience, I'm like, oh, I probably have to be like 10% body fat. Like I got to be at least 11 or 12. And and I'm not a t like percent body fats are like, I don't even like talking in percent body fats because there's so much relative error. Like people are like, oh, I went from 17 to 12. I'm like, I've done MRIs. I've done DEXs. I've done, done all of them. Like I don't, you don't, we don't know that you, you did lose probably a significant amount of adipose tissue, but I have no idea your body, what your body fat percentage went to what you went. I think pictures at a certain point are probably better than that. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of the, the why behind the journey. And, and also we don't have, like we have case studies now we have the DeSosa refuel papers on people gaining adipose tissue back this is we have the whole me paper which is which is pretty famous 2016 looking at post prep uh and then we have we have all of ryan's data that that we've collected which shows that on this come up it's very interesting on his last his last competitive season he was around he got dex at a bunch and he, everything was normal at like on the way down at eight or nine percent body fat everything was screwed up like all everything was screwed up, but on the way up at eight or nine percent body fat, everything was great. Um, so I think that was our first inclination. Like, and he was, I mean, he was still the same kind of the same place that I am right now. Like hamstrings and glutes weren't there, but everything else was like marked striated out. Um, and in a in that energy surplus, he was he was fine. Now, do I think that's the best anabolic environment? No, I think eventually you're just gonna probably want to be in a surplus. Um but still it's it's all it's all very interesting to me and i'm trying to get rid of my i think in the social media world one side of the of the fat loss camp is like very negative towards anyone who looks very lean we automatically associate that, that with something we we i think as a general population we we've we've moved away from like automatically associating body fatness with this right and unhealthiness that's kind of the Hayes model that's and and i've been i know i know enough about that model i i, I have friends in that model I've, I've had that discourse and i think that's important like weight stigmas and working through that and but objectively high the higher bmi you are the less likely that you are going to be metabolically healthy that doesn't mean that you are metabolically 
unhealthy. Um, that's a very important distinction. And I would say on the flip side, it's also an important distinction. Like just because someone is objectively lean does not mean that they are, you know, does not mean that their thyroid hormone is tanked. It does not mean that they're objectively unhealthy. I think the vast majority of shredded people on Instagram are probably living in a low energy state, but I think we should talk about that. I, I don't think there's a reason to just like assume. I think we should like, that's why I wanted to have this experience. Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the immediate thought that comes to mind is I think a lot of people think maybe similar to how you were thinking, how they diet down. Maybe they get like that below teen, like below 10%, sorry, kind of percent body fat. And they're like, man, there's no way I could sustain this, but that's because they're in a, a deficit. But if they were to bring the calories up to maintenance for like weeks, months, maybe then that would be a sustainable approach for them. And when I think about the post-show period for myself, at least, like I can agree, like I can feel objectively very well recovered and good. And I've still got like striations everywhere apart from my hamstrings and glutes are soft, like that's there. So yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if, if you experienced that uh, as well. And that would be a really interesting thing. Um, something I did want to ask was obviously you mentioned getting coached by Eric. And is that your first coach? And what led you to, so how have you found, uh, do you like being coached? And how do you find kind of, obviously, uh, I guess it would be interesting to hear you talk about some of the benefits of having a coach, even though like you're a PhD in nutrition, you're an incredibly smart individual, you know what to do, but what's the difference behind having someone in your corner versus like do, trying to do it yourself? Yeah, I've had, I've had a coach in some capacity probably for the last, five years just to have that sounding board um just to like just to have someone to even if they're just if even if they're not and no one's micromanaged my training or my diet and that obviously obviously that's kind of like eric's not gonna he's a very 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 good coach like that's not the first thing he's gonna do is use authoritarian like ten, like this is how much you need to eat like we're gonna work through it together um, and I tend to learn things from other, I like to experience other people's coaches and philosophies and how they work and even how they talk, um, and how they communicate with, with the people that they work with. And, and I think we can all learn from experiencing other people's, like just being a blank slate and allowing yourself to be that, that student. Um, and I think that's important. And, and so I, I learned a ton from, from being coached and I try not to like death grip my my programming if you will and i do think there's so i i come back to stt or self-determination theory a lot and and i think we have you know we have autonomy and i have i have a lot of autonomy like i i have a lot of skills i have a lot of competencies and i have a lot of resources but i think this is a i would argue that the biggest positive of probably this experience is the journey of self loss or transcendence. Um, if you think about the things that give our life meaning, um, those, those are, whether it's building a business or what, whatever it is, um, there seems to be this, the narrative of transcending something, climbing something seems to be important for meaning, uh, and life satisfaction. And I think if you go on those journeys, you probably want a Sherpa. Um, I don't know that you need someone to pull your sled. I don't think that's going to be helpful. I think you got to, you know, you got to walk through the snow. Uh, but I, I think having somebody there to, you know, just help you along the way, who's, who's also gone through that and, and had a similar experience. And, and when we look at like what gives groups meaning, it's generally shared suffering. Um, and that's why I wanted to do this with my friend um, and is just to, you know, to, to get those suffer credits together. Um, and then, then, and then we can have that silent moment where we go off of burgers afterwards and be like, that was fun. <laughs> and that burger will never taste as good. <laughs> it's going to be ridiculous. Uh, are, are you at the point where carrots, for example, taste sweet to you? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I like, I like this. So like I, to a, to a, I, I was, 
uh, I mean, I got burned on my arm when I was 19, took Buddhist vows. Like I, I like this, like, this is, this is what I was celibate for two years. Like I like this shit. Like I like right. suffering. I like, <laughs> I have to be careful with how much I like suffering. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I, I can become your identity. Like you can, you can love this stuff so much that you don't give yourself permission to have flexibility and do those other things. Um, yeah. Cause it is so such a strong identity driver um, and it can be across the bear. And then that cross the bear can be judgment on other people. And man, man, have I been there. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. Yeah, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I can definitely see those the kind of having that guide for the journey. Like it makes a ton of sense. And I think I always, that's, I often refer to coaching as like a, a walkthrough guide to like a console game. You can do it on your own, but you're probably going to come across a boss or something you can't beat. Whereas if you have yeah. the walkthrough guide, like you can take every challenge and not miss anything along the way. So it makes a ton of sense. And I'm very lucky I get to talk to people like yourself on a weekly basis. So I feel like I kind of get, that little bit of it uh but uh very met when when i talk to like people like you and kind of say these things i'm like oh, coach would be pretty cool at some point like i i know i'm gonna get one for my next prep uh to experience yeah. that and then that might be the ignition that i take it for future but i think it's very much a like uh, your training and nutrition like they're they're your babies in a sense and you don't like you said with eric it's not like he's taking them over and it's like right we're doing this we're changing everything but it, it's still something that i'm like oh, i don't know if i want to give that up kind of I'm a bit nervous about it but um yeah I think I could I can see why there's so many benefits and I mean I coach enough coaches to know that it, they tell me it's beneficial so uh, unless I put on my leg like I know there's a lot of benefits to that uh I was gonna ask in terms of you said you're feeling pretty all right right now I don't know if that's just the diet break talking but in terms of like diet <laughs> diet uh, sim uh sorry diet fatigue symptoms like yeah. how has your sleep changed anything like that has has being in the deficit made you kind of less I don't know uh, flexible with things and you've been more on top of like various habits that have led to just being more productive yeah I, I think being busy in this time has been helpful like having a lot of things to do so I'm not food focused um I'm that low level hunger kind of all the time is is interesting like at any get like you let me loose in a pantry like I'm just not gonna stop. Like, um, and and so that just that level of that insatiable hyperphagia is is interesting. And, and that's also, I think, good because if this is what maintaining weight loss is, because I think of a lot of this stuff is relative, right? Like if someone who is 290 and gets to 220 and they're still at you know 20, 20 in the 20s for percent body fat but if this is what it was if this is what it's like if this is what i gotta live my life like no way no no way so like i i i don't know what it's like to do that nor am i gonna go do that but objectively i am maintaining at least 10 percent weight loss right now off my highest point um and and so yeah it's been it's been eye-opening so the hunger has been one thing. Another thing has been like at the end of, you know, at the end of a string of low days. And I really liked what Berto talked about. It was like, you gotta, you gotta be ready. And then you just kind of got to go for it. Like you got to Like, I, 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 I agree with that. Like five to six low days in a row is the last bit of that. You're just like, man, I walking. It's just like, dude, I don't want to do this. Um, and, and there's another thing that has been very, very interesting that I do that I didn't have any idea that was going to happen. Uh, and that's like just an overall level of apathy. Um, yeah. It's super weird. Like 
like things like things will happen like my flights will be delayed or something will happen I'm like <laughs> i just don't care like i just don't care like you can't make me care like i just don't care um and so like people talk about like not sweating the small stuff but when you're like really hungry like you just don't care so like i thought i would be like way more stressed i'm actually not i'm actually just like <laughs> which, which which could be like which is very surprising to me i was like dude like the other day like my like my Google Sheets didn't work, like which for me is a big deal. Like a lot of my things are in Google Sheets. It just wasn't working. And I was just like, all right, <laughs> I'll just do something else. <laughs> but I like three months ago, I would have been, I would have been off my lid. Um, so it was it, it's been it's been interesting. And then you asked about sleep. Um, so like a string of low days, I will wake up. I know that's another benefit that I do have. I will know intuitively and i'll use that word there because it is intuitive i will know experientially if i am in a deficit of calories or not like i can i will i know i just know because i have to go to sleep hungry um like and then i just get to the next day i think a lot of this is is just like getting to the next day getting to the next meal just getting to that next point um and like it's not saying that you can't have it because then it just becomes like this this you create more of a reward there, but it's like oh, I just can't have that now. It's not that big deal. I just can't have it now. Yeah, I think uh, the the apathy there. I, I was smiling and like nodding my head a lot because that's one of the things. Like this prep, I really experienced. And me and Pascal on our like improvement season segment, we talk about this. Just like we both were in prep and had this apathy of just like literally, we'd say like his wife or my girlfriend would be like talking about their day and we're like, yeah, just don't care. Like you can't say it and you have to be like careful and you have to almost fake emotions, which is just a, a weird yeah. thing. You, you change, you become less of yourself, I find like, you and maybe a little bit more of a asshole <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> Hopefully yeah, you I haven't. <laughs> I probably did. Yeah, I have a daughter. So like uh, my wife, my wife would rightfully have kind of zero... Uh, tolerance for that and and i did yeah. have two episodes where i almost fainted because like i just like had i got up too fast and, and i already have like kind of lower blood pressure and so i like okay. had to grab something and so she was she was not happy about that and rightfully so right um but i think i've done a good job of being of of still being present with my family still cooking meals still doing all the things i think if there's one thing that i've done two things that I've done really well. It's like my training has been on point, way more on point than I thought. And then all of that energy, like if any, if anything, I've made a mental push and I'm not that lean yet. I think that it, that's why I'm not necessarily willing to go to where, um, where Ryan is right now, uh, where you have been. That's one of the main reasons. Like, I think I'm at the cusp of it. Like, I think like if I went down deeper into this thing, I would, that would probably, there would, I always look at it like every stair step is going to have a different price. Like the price for me going from mid 180s to 170 was, I had to not, I didn't really out go out to eat. Um, I limited my processed food intake. I was eating a lot more. I was eating mostly vegetables. Um, my carb sources were pretty much brown rice, corn, things like that. Just whole, I ate a lot of whole foods. That was the price for that. The price for this. And, and higher step counts, but I maintain higher step counts. So that's not like a, pr a, a price for me. I don't, I can't even imagine life without them. Um, and so, and, and I realize that that has a level of, of resources and competencies to it. Um, but so the price for where I'm at now is I had to count like, cause I've never been here before. So I had to use my, my micromanaging brain to weigh things. And that, I mean, I had, now the price is I'm only eating lean proteins. Like I can't get, I couldn't eat fatty. Like I, I would, I wouldn't make it like my fat would like, cause my fat's at like 50 to 60 grams. Um, and so like, it's very easy to blow that out. And so you, you, I think it's really, really important, even if you're not a bodybuilding coach, but if you work with people with any type of weight loss, I think one thing that I think I've done well is I've tried to experience every diet. Like I've, I've done veganism for a day. I've done keto for a week. Like I've done these things and you realize the limitations of them. And I've gone, I've gone low fat before in my life, but if you've never done these things, I think it's good to like, wow, just with this macronutrient restriction, it results 
in a lot of other restrictions just because you can't logistically eat those foods. Like you can't have a ribeye if you only have 50 grams or if you have four eggs, like you just blast it. Now you're only eating fruits and like raw food, like or uh, like vegetables cooked, but no oil added for the rest of the day. Right. So at, you just start to understand the prices of these things. And you also understand like where people get into trouble. Yeah. And, I think and that, so they're valuable experience. No, no, I interjected on you that yeah i mean that's really interesting and i i love the idea of like each level has a new price tag attached to it because it's yeah. definitely true uh at least for me there's like a point in i can remember after my first show of my last prep it was just like after that show i was in that new price tag of just it, and that now things have got serious now like i when me and pascal talk about it like being on fire you're on fire like you can have refeeds you can have die breaks you're not going to put out the fire you need to get out of this at some point otherwise you're just going to burn burn to death uh but i wanted to talk about uh, the refeeds because obviously this is something that's kind of in the literature and we kind of have an understanding of those have you got a new appreciation from them in terms of obviously like alberto great example of someone who does use refeeds getting towards stage and has been and 3dmj as, as a whole have been pretty um kind of popularizing them and they they think they're of use have you found them how have you found them have you used them before has it changed any of your perspectives on them do you think the literature isn't showing something that maybe you've experienced yeah i use refeeds and diet breaks in when i coach people um i use i didn't have any refeeds my I didn't need, I didn't feel like I needed them in the first bit. Like I didn't take them cause I didn't feel very restricted. Um, but I, once I got to this point, I definitely felt like they were, they were good for a couple of reasons. I think they're always, they're always, in my opinion, diet breaks and refeeds, the most important aspect of them for the general population or whatever we want to call that journey is that you are practicing the diet after the diet. You're working on not being attached to this lower calorie intake. You're working on um, a state of maximization, not necessarily this this ideology of restriction. And I think that's very, very important. So even if you take, even if the diet takes a little bit longer, you're gonna you know you're gonna be able to be more social. You're gonna learn. Okay, this is how much water I put on when I go back into an excess. When I go back into a maintenance, even maintenance calorie, you're gonna, everybody's different in how they put back on water. Um, and so you're going to see that. And I think that's really, really important to have that experience. So you don't freak out when you get to the end of your diet because you gain four pounds because you just started eating more and that's food in your GI tract. And then you're going to, you're going to get some water on board. Cause that's just what happens when people come out of active deficits. Um, so I'm a big, I'm a big fan of refeeds, refeeds and diet breaks. Um, Eric, I think maybe obviously to those folks who know him in 3DMJ, he's going to put that. I think he's mostly going to put them back to back. Um, because if, if you look at the mechanistic research, it looks like two days, maybe you get some type of leptin signaling or something like that. Um, and then, uh, we have the Matador study and the ice cap study that showed probably nothing happening from like a thyroid perspective or maybe something with appetite. Um, but I, I think subjectively and psychologically, the biggest benefit is going to be the practicing of maintenance. And then also I will say at this point. I notice a drastic difference in my trade. And that could be psychological, but I don't think it is. Like my day, like my training, my hardest training days are the days after my first refeed. And then the, like they're bunched in that. So I'm noticeably glycogen replenished. You'll see my body weight go up one to two pounds. You can see it kind of cyclically. Um, and yeah, those are my, those are definitely my hardest sessions. And, and they, I get more little few more reps and overall the RP of the session is, is less and my motivation to train is more. So, but it's hard to say how much of that is physiological, how much is psychological. I guess it's uh physiology and psychology like they are so intertwined that it's like, who cares if it's all psychological, if it's doing the physiology side, like it's doing it, isn't it? So uh, that makes a ton of sense. And I always think of like refeeds and diet breaks. They're like more macro level, uh, nutrient timing strategies when you think about like the yeah. general evidence-based like recommendation is have some carbohydrates around your training session well you're thinking like uh, like if you're having higher kind of carbohydrate days you're having literally more carbohydrates around training sessions surely it's then going to fuel better performance and my last prep uh similar to you or at least i would hope it would it kind of replenish glycogen stores if they're more full i after being in a depleted state i would have thought so but i'll Maybe you've got something to, to counter. I don't think it would affect acute strength. 
I think it will. But, I would I would argue that it probably gives you more volume tolerance. Sure. That would be that. Was, so I what I've seen is like my first set is pretty good regardless. Um, and then my second and third sets, if I if I have a third set, if I'm depending on my volume for the day. And then so my first like normally the way my training set up, I'll have I have two times a week frequency per muscle group. And then I'll have either four or six sets. So I'm at, I'm at like an eight, I'm in a lower volume range right line. So like eight to 12 sets per week. And, and the first sets of those days are, are pretty solid regardless, but the back end volume can be a drudge. Like it can just, I feel like I'm in mud. Um, if I, but on those refeed days, I do feel like I have a little bit more volume tolerance. And I think that lines up with the, glycogen replenishment literature and also the glycogen and performance literature um because the body can replete glycogen with no food it just takes a lot of time um right. and even being the other thing that i think we don't have enough literature on is we don't know we know to some degree and we this is in endurance athletes just being in a deficit with higher carbs still will lower your overall glycogen content of the so even if you're in a deficit and you're eating a lot of carbs you still could have muscle glycogen go down in fact we'd expect it because your body's going to utilize those carbohydrates for energy whereas i think one of the most important parts of the refeed is actually getting back into energy balance plus the carbohydrates that's that's what i think probably repletes those are two signals that aren't necessarily the same like, yeah, you're getting a bunch of carbs, it's going to bring on a bunch of water, but you're also pulling yourself out of an active deficit. So you don't have to use all of those carbs for energy. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a ton of sense. And uh, actually, you mentioned training and training volume, it was something I was going to ask about. Has that changed through kind of this period of time? Have you come to a lower volume from higher volumes? Or what's that look like for you? Yeah, I've kind of taken this entire and that's really been kind of Ryan and my talking about it too. Like I, if I don't think like I'm going to get massively bigger on this cut. Like, I just don't think like this is what the time to like push that envelope. And, and so my volume has been on the maintenance side. And then I've done a lot of volume cycling, trying to figure like, cause my training age is I'm 30, going to be 37. And I've been training since I was 13 years old. So like my training, my, my training age is like 24, um, 24 years. So I've been, I've been training almost doubly the amount of time that I've been alive. Um, and, and so, and I do think like my, I don't know my legs. Like if you, if you look at Meadows calculator, like my legs are like 103%, like most of my, most of my body parts are in the high nineties or over hundred percent. Um, but I'd argue that there are probably still some areas of my physique that I can, can get bigger. Um, and so I've been toying with kind of those advanced methodologies in my last off season, which was, um, uh, I did a lot of volume cycling for my back. Cause I think my back, my, like my upper back was probably my, my least trained, my upper back, and my lats were probably my least trained muscle. And I think I've brought those up to a significant degree by focusing on them. I can't, I can't really figure, I can't, I have no way of knowing whether it was the increased volume or like the attention to detail, uh, in which I trained those muscles. Um, but I, I, I trained those muscles at long muscle lengths. I brought them up to, you know, at one point, some of my back volume, just my upper back was at 30 sets per week. So I Whoa, trained, yeah. yeah, I trained back five times a week. Um, and I, I think that I've made strides. So my next off season, I'm going to try to play with some of those kind of strategies. Cause I got nothing left. Right. Um, and also just one thing that has been surprising me with my training is I don't do a lot. I haven't done, cause I've kind of, I've taken some of these sports out as far as I want to, like the price is like the price has gotten, like I've snatched 270. I've cleaned, I've cleaned 330 in pounds, like, which is for, for a guy who's 185 is, you know, it's not awesome, but it's, it's decent enough. Um, and I, like I've, I have decent numbers in those lifts. So I've kind of let those go and I've really transitioned to more cables. The only press that I have right now that is like, is a dumbbell press. And I'm even considering getting rid of that. 
Um, and, and so I'm, my squats are pendulum squats and like a hip sled and like unilateral leg presses. And it's been really, really interesting. So like, I think you would call those exercises more stupid. Like there's, I don't have, there's not a lot of technique involved. I just get on the exercise and I mash and I haven't seen, man, some of my, it's, it's wild, but the things that aren't like weight dependent or range of motion dependent. So if you lose 20 pounds, you're going to probably have to squat deeper because all of a sudden your hamstrings are farther away from your calves, right? To some degree. Um, so anything that's not dictated by range, range of motion, I haven't, I've even gotten so, stronger on some exercises, which has been really, really surprising to me is like my rep drop off on some of these accessory movements have not been there and I've gone up on some of them uh, with consistent training, which has been cool. Yeah, that's, that is actually a question I was going to ask was if exercise selection had changed at all, because I completely agree with you. Like, uh, I think it was Barbara bent over rowing dropped off first for me. Like I was just like, man, I just, I like whatever my belly's maybe got smaller and now the range of motion has increased or I'm not as anchored to the ground because my leg have lost so much weight yeah. from my posterior. So I was like, I'm rotating that one out, but I was super chuffed that one of the lifts i was like hack squats for my quads i was like quads that need to maintain that muscle because they're not like a huge uh, strong point for me and i managed to maintain performance like throughout the whole time like i never dropped the rep uh right. so i was like uh, really chuffed with that but uh my question would be do you think i i would think that that is a good sign that you're maintaining muscle mass do you think we can be sure you're maintaining muscle mass if you're maintaining performance though yeah i got I have, I have no real idea. And I think our ability to measure is, I think it's impossible. Um, I just think that it's, it, I have, I, I, I carry two ultrasounds with me. Like I've been ultrasounding myself this, this entire time. And like <laughs> I've, I've had an, like I've been using ultrasounds since I was 20, like for over 10 years. Uh, so I'm fairly good at driving them. And man, I, I couldn't tell you like, and, and so I, I think if your performance is the way I look at it is this is a long game and it's a long game that we can't objectively measure, especially with water moving around. I think the best measurement is probably like how you show up as, as much as people hate to say this, like, what do you look like three years from now? And if you need some, if you need some measurement before that, probably not the game for you. Like, cause this is, this is the, this is the game of depreciating returns. It is the game of, you know, it is the ultimate marshmallow contest. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I think, I think if you're in, that's where I come back to what you said, the process, like I'm in it for the process. I, I mean, yeah, I, I love training. I do. I do genuinely really love training. And that's one of the first things, like I haven't felt not wanting to train in a really long time. Cause I've been in, in an excess of calories or like I've been fully torqued to train for like three or four years now. Um, and so I had moments where I just did it. I literally like I'm a robot as far as like the mornings are concerned. Like I just do the same things, walk in the gym. And I had moments where I really like, we're talking like arm day. Like I had <laughs> biceps, triceps dealt in some like accessory lower body movements and I was like, dude, no, I don't want to do this right now. I don't want to. There's nothing, I had nothing else to do, I, but I didn't want to do it. And, and obviously like the habit, the routine, yeah. you just keep doing it. You just do the next thing. Um, but that, it was interesting to watch that. Like I haven't had, I haven't, I hadn't had that in years where I just like genuinely, man, I don't, know, I, don't I just don't want to do this right now. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.
yeah, that's something I think anyone who, because again, we all, a lot of us compete because we love the training, but then like literally you lose that love towards the end. So I always found that with the post-show kind of period where like I'm, hyped to train so it's, it's it's super easy and i've never struggled with like the recovery well if anything i've struggled being letting up enough i've always been a little bit too strict i was probably the best when i was in vegas and i was like all my devices were taken away from me were eating out everywhere and stuff and i was like oh this is actually great i don't i can't micromanage like steve normally would try and micromanage everything uh but it's very interesting in turn and i think that's I, I like just the honesty there i think some people would like to like guarantee if you maintained kind of performance i mean obviously it's a good thing to maintain performance but you still just can't guarantee these things and i like that thought process as well and it, because it, it sings to me in terms of like, I think trust the process maybe is the wrong word because it's like, we know the process works. It just might work so slowly that you just have to kind of go with it and just keep going and some, somewhere down the line, you're going to look back and be like, oh yeah, all that hard work has paid off. But in the moment, you don't know when you're as advanced as where, especially with your training age of over like two decades, just like you, you, you can't possibly think about short term, like, oh, have I gained muscle like this month? It's like, that's completely not helpful for you. Yeah, and, and I, if you look at the air bars on Dexa, even a four, like if, even if Grant Tinsley's your friend, like Grant Tinsley's my friend, um, we we I I blow up his email a lot, and like even if I could go to his lab and do the gold standard measurement, like maybe even like deuterium body water, whatever, all the all the big words, um, do I think that th that has the ability to pick up two pounds of fat free mass? Maybe, maybe if, if my, like, if my life is regimented, regimented time point to time point, it is the same time point to time point, the amount of food I'm eating, the types of foods, like, but th that regimentation has a cost. Um, and so uh, maybe, maybe it'd be possible to pick that up. And if you're advanced, you're probably talking about man, maybe can you gain a pound of muscle mass in a year? And then just the hydration status of that tissue itself is going to have so much noise, um, and so that I don't know that we can measure it. And I, and I know that that's frustrating and cause people want to have this objective. Like, did I get bigger? Well, I, dude, I, I don't know. Do you look yeah. bigger? <laughs> cause that's sport. Yeah. <laughs> do you look, do you look more jacked? <laughs> cause that's probably the only thing that matters. Um, so that, that's where my, that's where my head's at there. And now do I think, do I think that it's, a decent idea to get some rough body estimates. I do like them. So for instance, if people are not, Ryan hates, he hates Instagram. He does not play on the game. Um, and, and so he is, has an F my, he's probably the only lifetime natty person that I've seen. Who's not very big. Who's not an offensive lineman um, or, you know, a heavyweight wrestler or something like that who has an F, a fat free mass index way over 27, maybe even 28. Wow. That's big. Yeah. Like he has 200 pounds of lean on his frame. Um, he's just got a, and he's five eleven, um, maybe five. He's not even over six foot down. Nah, if he's my height, yeah. I'm, I'm like, damn this guy. <laughs> yeah. And so he just has a lot of muscle. Yeah. But I, a lot of probably and bone too. He's on like the, he's on the top echelon of bone. If you look at his Dexa scan. <laughs> right. uh, so it's not all, it's not all muscle. He's just got, he looks like the Michelin man on his Dexa with his bone. Um, and, and so I do think that some semblance of that is important. Like, so you could, you could estimate that I like comparatively, I maybe have like mid one fifties of lean. Um, and I'm five, nine. And, and so, I think that value is somewhat important for what I talked about earlier. And that's KCALs per kilogram of fat free mass. Cause I think if you can get yourself back up to 45, that's, it gives you a good place to know where you, it gives you a good shot. Everybody's gonna be different. There's a ton of individual variability, but, but for him, that's an energy availability. I'm gonna do the math right now. I think it's close to four G's. I think it's like, let me do it. Yeah, so if we put that in, and we got to remember that that is not including exercise. Yeah, his energy availability that at 45 is 4,090 calories for his level of lean. So that means 
that if he, you know, burns 300 to 400 calories with exercise, he's got to go on top of that. So now all of a sudden we're talking about like, he's got to get up to 4,400, 4,500 calories of intake on repeat after this. Um, and that's, that's hard to do like that. It, in in macros that's i mean you're going to be pushing 500 to 600 grams of carbs on repeat yeah easily and, and whereas for me for me it's like mine is mine's going to be 3200 so somewhere in there like 3000 to 3200 and right now on my diet break i'm at 2800 to 2900 so i'm still i'm still not there yet and i'm maintaining weight at that so i'm probably still in a little bit of a deficit and then for my active deficit i had to go down into like 26 27 energy availability um and that's where we would expect that you would get these physiologic perturbations from and so it's it's been it's been interesting to have that red ass literature in my the back of my head like to get for, in the low 170s to get to 165 i had to go there yeah. i had to I, like it was to move that needle i had to be at 2100 to 2300 calories and 18000 steps like that was that was 16000 six, 18000 steps like that was the price of moving that needle and fairly slowly on a weekly average that was just the price of it um and that price was, if I, I mean, rough, do the math on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely under 30. I'm from an energy availability standpoint, probably pushing 26, 27 um, kcals per kilogram of fat free mass. So that was, that was just par for the course. That was the price yeah. of getting down there. I guess it makes sense why you're kind of referring back to earlier where you're kind of like, getting deeper than this it's just not going to be worth the cost and that lines up exactly with where you're looking at all this as well so it's nice when things work out how you kind of expect them to in that sense uh where do you see yourself going then i, I don't know where you are now obviously you're taking a diet break how many more weeks left have you got uh before you start like taking food up yeah coming out um so i'm gonna take probably this what is it it's Thursday. I'm going to take into, into next week in a diet break. And then I'll probably reassess, maybe do like two to three more weeks of an active deficit. Um, and then I'll come out. So I'm going to get, I'm going to grab labs next week if this little cold goes away. Um, and then I'll do two to three more weeks and then I'll come out. And when I come out, I'm going to do something that, that is, I think I'm going to have multiple, multiple things that I'm going to do, which is not ideal for science, but I'm not trying to do this again. And again, um, and so I will, my saturated fat is very low right now. Um, and my lipids are perennially like sub 140, like total cholesterol, like my cholesterol is like, I'm giving away personal health information, but I don't, it doesn't, I don't care. Uh, my lipids, I don't know what that is in European units, but my lipids are very low. Um, and so I am going to pull some Spencer Nadelsky and I am going to add butter back. So I'm going to add, I'm going to take my carbs up and I'm going to add butter. I'm going to, I don't usually eat butter. So, but I'm going to add butter. I'm going to see if in an excess of calories, I can even move my lipids up, see what happens to my serum testosterone. So like, that's my little toy experiment. And then I'm going to take away butter and get kind of get back to my normal diet and see if that affects my testosterone levels. Cause we do have, I don't know what the mechanism here I'd be and I, I have researched hormones to a level that I don't think many people outside of hormone researchers have listened, have researched them. I, I don't necessarily know the mechanism of action here because I don't think that it is, um, I don't think that it's like a surplus or like a substrate issue. Like the, the, the rate limiting step of testosterone synthesis is not the availability of, of serum cholesterol. That's not the rate limiting step of cholesterol, of testosterone um, for males. And so I, I don't know what the, the mechanism is, but maybe it's brain based. Maybe the body picks up on this, but it does look through multiple lines of evidence that we do see higher saturated fat intakes result in, you know, 10 to 20% jumps in serum testosterone. And all the research that we have shows that that doesn't necessarily matter for strength or hypertrophy, which is, which is in line with slight changes in testosterone probably are not predictive, but I'm just curious. Um, and, and so I'm curious to see what happens to my lipids. I'm curious to see what happens. Like, maybe this is just a signal that the body has energy and just another one. Um, 
that's that's where my head's at. So there's a little uh, little nerd shoot that someone yeah. might find interesting. <laughs> I think that uh, I th- it makes me want to take bloods more often. Uh, it's just I don't know if yours is is like a, you have a convenient way of doing it, but I'm always put off just because I'm like ah, needles, not big fan, and then going and get the blood work. But uh, at least you're getting it, and the important thing you're doing, although you said you're measuring a few things and changing a few things, which yeah, you, the more variables you can keep static, the more sure you can be kind of what you're doing is moving the needle in the right direction you can be sure it's that one thing uh but yeah i don't know if you find blood work is easier to easy to come by i don't know if you've got a nice setup yeah we 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 do we can we can run labs in 47 states so we can um, oh okay you do it in-house perfect yeah we can we can pull them like i, I have we have friends and like we just, we can we can pull we have a we have a little a group of scientists that uh we can we can grab labs and then we can send them out to people if we need to send them out um in the u.s and so yeah we can like i'll grab leptin i'll get so i'll grab some some somewhat weird mark like i'll get an ultra sensitive estradiol i'll get i'll get some fancy mark i'll get the you know equilibrium dialysis free testosterone so like i'll get i'm not going to pay 115 dollars for the fancy free t3 uh free t interest like i think if i had to pick a couple values to and this is this is actually, that was good. So one of the things that, that I think is really, I come back to this in the health argument on the higher adiposity side. We don't need to talk about adiposity. Let's just get markers of health. Like a hemoglobin A1C, t- it costs like $5. Like let's, let's just look at a hemoglobin A1C. Um, I understand that there's maybe some problems there, but less problems than to me than, you know, weight sigma and all those other things. Um, Let's talk about prediabetes instead of talking about obesity. Let's just talk like, like let's just talk about prediabetes and and other things. Um, I think that's cleaner. On the flip side, I think the DeSosa papers show us that man, T3 is a pretty free T3 and total T3, man, they they correlate pretty well. Um, so total T3, you might want to get that like above 90 um on the on the US measurements. And then free T3. And we've we've seen this in our data too, um, just longitudinally with people cutting, is you're gonna get teeth, you're gonna kind of get what we, we call like free T3 syndrome in endurance athletes, is in this low energy state where you you do get this reduction in thyroid hormone. And then you on top of that, you get a reduction in the the free or available thyroid hormone. It's just free T3 has it's so small and the serum levels are minute i think it's in picograms per milliliter or something like that like very small amounts um so there is a potential high rate of error on the test just like there's a high rate of error in free testosterone um so one that comes back to the science system me like if you have a high rate of error on the test time point to time point your ability to pick up a significant finding outside of the error rate on the lab is going to you're gonna have to overwhelm that um and so that's where like you want to have somebody if you're doing labs normal doctors aren't going to know this but you want to know the the analytical variation of the of the tr- thing that you're getting because you will have to overwhelm that otherwise it's just noise in it's just air just how we talk about with body comps is it's just air yeah you're just you're mistaking signal for noise yeah, I think that's really well said. It's like, I don't know if there's a 5% error rate and you're trying to measure percentages less than 5%. It's like, well, well, you're wasting your time completely doing that. So, oh man, Ben, I could probably talk to you uh, for ages about this sort of stuff, but I think it's been really insightful, at least just talking about some of your experience here and uh, some why you're doing it in the first place and uh, kind of what you've taken from it so far. So yeah, I'm excited. I imagine you'll do, uh, are you going to do like a write-up or anything? Are you planning anything or what have you got on the cards for that? Yeah, definitely when I'm, when I'm done, I'll probably do some type of recap, share the data, share the data no matter what it is. I'll probably share the data in some format with somebody. I think Ryan and I will probably do a debrief um, cool. because he's got, we have his, we have now, we have two seasons of his data. Um, and so his, his data, we use it in our courses um, because it's so, it's so interesting. And I think like the objectification of the data allows people to like, oh, like you use the analogy of like, I'm on fire. Yeah, you're on, like, you're on fire. Like this is not like the people that we, this is, this is my, I think this is a good thing to end on the, a, lot, a lot of the people that you see shredsville on the gram 
they are pr- like some of them may be like told to immediately seek hospitalization. Like that's like that's how bad some of their, crazy. Their, yeah. their labs would be. Like we're talking about in inside of this realm, you can get you can get liver injury. Like there there's there are there is someone like that's another reason like you might not see me go like I'm not trying to be alarmist. I'm not trying to be that person, but you can you can look up anorexia and 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 some some of these markers and like you I don't think like to my knowledge people aren't dying necessarily on the natty stage they're in the enhanced world you're a lot of that is probably diuretics and then maybe the reemergence of dnp um i i don't know like that's not my area of expertise nor do i try to try to make it so um but in the natty world i, I don't think we see people dying but man your body is not happy um and there's a, there's generally a lot of inflammation running around the immune system is cooked and this is not a place that you want to stay, especially if you care about adaptations. And I would argue, especially not as, as place, a place to stay if you care about health. And, and that's where I feel like getting this lower interve- intervention point is such a big deal. Because if you can, sh- not that it matters, if, like if you can show yourself that you're healthy at a level of leanness, like your, your thyroid hormones back, uh, if you're a female, you're you're menstruating normally. You don't have a short luteal phase. Like for objectively, all of your mar- everything you feel good, and objectively things look all right, and you're nine percent body fat. I don't know that that's the best place for adaptation, but if you now that's a choice. If, if you want to live there for your business on the gram or whatever, that's now you're making an objective choice. That to me is way different than you just like living Shredsville and selling eBooks. And you're not healthy at all. Whereas the other one is like, okay, now we're actually having a discussion about that. And that's that's one of that was one of my goals going into this is kind of show that process of potentially like, hey, you wanna you wanna live lean for the gram? Here is the here's probably gonna be the price of that. Yeah. Is it worth it for you? Yeah. No judgment. I, I think that could be really powerful content because even you saying it there is like part of me is like, I don't wanna believe it, but I'm pretty sure ignorance is I don't know if it is bliss at that point, but it's kind of bliss for me because I'm like, I don't want to get blood work when I'm shredded because I know it's going to look like shit. I know I'm going to get into this recovery diet, hopefully to that lower intervention point pretty much, and then going for like a nice productive improvement season, I'll call it. Uh, So yeah, I think that would be really cool to see. So um, in terms of where you'll be publishing that, is that something you'll put on your website or where if people listening, will they be able to get access you're not sure at the moment uh, i probably i would guess i'll go on iron culture and talk i would i would Amazing. guess that yeah cool. i would guess i would guess i'll probably go on ic and and uh i'll probably have all those all those numbers and, and we'll talk about that amazing i would guess that that seems like the right move right yeah. it seems like the right play yeah uh if you can deal with uh omar and uh his awful jokes no i'm joking <laughs> obviously you like eric so i had to take a dig at omar so yeah i'm sure our listeners will be listening to the iron culture podcast so definitely uh, make sure to keep your eyes peeled for that one and yeah ben just to thank you again for taking the time it's always fun chatting to you uh always some brilliant insights and if people want to learn more from you, like follow you along in these final steps of the journey, or actually by the time this comes out, maybe you'll have just about been finished, but I'm sure there'll be some bits of glimpses on the gram. So uh, yeah, but where else should they check check out? Sorry. Yeah. Um, at DR Ben House is probably the best place on Instagram. And then uh, my writings are on deconstructnutrition.com. It's it's eight bucks a month. Like you can, I don't see anyone. If you cancel, I don't know. I don't care. Like there's like, you can, I'm I'm trying to give this stuff away as much as I can. And I, but I do think that it's, it's good to have skin in the game, but if you don't have $8 and you don't want to pay for it or whatever, and you really want to learn more about TRT or testosterone or exogenous growth hormone or any of the articles that are on there, you can message me. You can DM me on Instagram and be like, yo, I just want a membership. I don't really want to pay. I don't have the money right now. I truly can't afford it. And I will give you one just like Sam Harris. I don't care. I'll give you it. doesn't matter to me. Um, I just want us to all get better at this craft. Um, and that's that's my goal. Well, that's a, a lovely message to end on. I'm sure the audience will be very appreciative of that. And I would highly recommend you check it out. I've dug into a few articles here and there. And I think, well, some of them spawned into podcasts and it's good stuff like 
as you can tell, Ben knows his stuff and he goes into depth with these things. So I'm sure a lot of the listeners will be interested in that sort of content. So again, I'll make sure that's all linked in the description. And Ben, thank you so much for coming on again. And guys, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can log your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're going to have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're going to go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're going to be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.